Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, I'm armed with directions, all right? <laughs> now let's see if I follow them. Can you see me? <laughs> I'm sorry, I still like need a lot of attention from time to time, and um, I can't see pe- certain people for the microphones. Oh, well, I'm sure you'll hear me. Um, welcome here, especially to the newcomers. Uh, you know, I was, I was listening to Jimmy do like that countdown thing, you know, and I was remembering back to like the first meeting, barely, that I can remember, and I wouldn't have been able to fit, you know, like stand up at the right time. You know, I was that jacked up. Um, and I think I was real lucky for that. You know, I got here after 17 years of drinking daily. I started when I was nine. I got here again, sent in uh, the summer of 86. And it's still really foggy. So if I seem kind of like I don't know what I'm talking about, it's because it's just really foggy. Um, and I'd like to tell you that 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 I had, you know, like, that when I got here in the condition that I was in, that drinking was what got me here in my mind, and that's not true. What was going on in my head was, wow, I wonder how much longer I can play this card out, you know. Um, I was married at the time, and um, I, my husband, in the summer of 86, decided that he was going to take out a power of attorney and have me locked up in a mental institution if I didn't get my act together, But then again, his opinion was that I need to learn how to control my drinking, you know. And uh, my mother had locked me out of the house. I couldn't get into her house anymore because I had beaten her up too many times and stolen from her. And um, I was sent in 1986 to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I'd like to tell you that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard the message and I got sober. I hear that from time to time. However, I'm not an alcoholic of that variety in recovery. I'm the person who, like, if I were here tonight, you know, if this had been, you know, from June to November of 1986, you would have smelled me coming, okay? I reeked. I came drunk. I went to my first AA dance drunk, you know, and um, nobody told me I had to get out, and nobody told me much of anything. Uh, there came a point somewhere in there, I think somewhere around September, Octoberish, that I, the Greenhaven group that I was going to, drunk, um, drew me a map to group three and suggested that I go there because they had beginners meetings, and I had a lot of questions, and they thought the questions could get answered there, and um, I did, you know, but... I would drink, go to meetings, drink, go to meetings, and think, 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 think. And I'd stay up all night, think, 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 and drink. And what happened, what finally caught my attention in November, wasn't that alcohol was my problem per se, you know. Um, I Right around the time I went to those beginners meetings, they had made a comment about, you know, this is the basic text, and they held up the book, and they said, you're supposed to read it, you know, this is where the program is. And I remembered I had one, because in 1983, when I was still at Cal Poly, well, pretending I was still at Cal Poly, um, I went to this counselor, and she had me go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the thing I got from that meeting was a book. And um, I hadn't read it, but I had kept it because I was like that. You know, I hoarded a lot of things. And so I went home and got the book, got a bottle of gin, sat down and started reading it. And I understood what it said, you know. Um, The problem was, I came to find out later, that our program presupposes you're sober, you know, that you have put the plug in the jug, and then you commence to work the steps. Well, I was trying to drink and wait, and I literally was waiting for God to zap me sober somewhere in the process, you know. Because um, I, I really had a very arrogant attitude. My attitude with God was just as arrogant. And it was, if you're all that damn bad, come strike me sober, you know. Because nobody has been able to do it. I was in and out of hospitals. Um, first time I went before a judge, I was 14 years old. It was for driving without a license. They didn't mention that I was loaded and quite drunk. Um, and that's only because the cop was a friend of my dad's. 
And that's the way it went for me. That's the only reason I have no record, you know, it's because the cops and judges and all these other lawyers were friends of the family, you know, so they didn't write me up on these things. And anyway, so I read that book and I got that and I kept going to meetings and I kept waiting. And so I figured the best thing to do while you're waiting is drink, you know, so I would drink and wait. And what finally started to happen was in November, I, um, <laughs> I had gotten to the point, well, it had gotten to my point, my life had gotten to the point where I did not like being with me. And I did not like the way people treated me. And I did not like the way they were reacting to me. You know, uh, the phone didn't ring for me anymore. You know, and my husband was, you know, doing dramatic things. You know, we tend to marry people a lot like us. I found that out years later um, after the divorce. But, it, it, you know, he was doing these drama things, and so I would run to meetings. And what he did, one of his drama attacks, um, was no alcohol in the house. Now, this man liked to drink, you know, but no alcohol in the house. And so what happened November 24th, 1986, I had gone to a meeting, and I went home, and I was getting ready to go over to the Greenhaven group that evening for another meeting, and there was no booze in the house, and I needed to drink really bad. And so I started going through the kitchen. You know, I have a college background, and a lot of it's in biology, and um, so I know all the different forms you can get alcohol in, and, and I was searching for any form I could find. And uh, I found it in sherry, and I found it in vanilla extract, and I found it in Listerine, and then it was about 7.30, and I was sitting there with a bottle of rubbing alcohol, wondering if you would really die, or if you could drink a certain amount of it and not die. You know, just enough to get me to the meeting. And I was sure I could hustle up some money at the meeting, get a bottle, and get home and get right, you know. And um, I, didn't, I decided not to try that one, you know, because I, I realized it would be a real violent death. So I went to the meeting, and it just so happened that evening this guy talked about a guy who got here in the condition where, you know, he was like DOA, you know, the toe on the tag number almost. And um, what had happened was his last drink was butane lighter fluid and black shoe polish. And that caught my attention. That finally, that was the message. That was what caught my attention in AA was somebody's story. And I went up to this guy after the meeting. I said, did he live? I need to know, did he live? And he said, yeah, he's sober now. You know, and I thought, cool. You know, maybe rubbing alcohol isn't a bad idea. And what happened was I went home and my husband was so bizarre, you know, that I just went to sleep and it just didn't happen. It was not by virtue, it was by circumstance. And the next day, I um, went to this meeting, and I'm leaving little parts out because I got a rush, but I land in this um, step study at group three, and this woman was sitting up there named Shirley, and Shirley has this cackle, and at the time she had these long red fingernails, and she would flutter them around, and, she, ah, and she'd do this cackle sound, and I thought, my God, <laughs> this is grim, you know. But the choices were stay here and figure it out. Or you have no place to go. And um, what happened was that night a woman came in and she pointed across the room. And she said, ask that woman to be your sponsor. And I did. And um, I just haven't drank since. You know, it's kind of like I was out of aces. I didn't have any more games to play. I knew if I went home I was going to be drunk before I got there and I'd be locked up that night. And I knew if they ever locked me up, I knew I was mentally different and I was not getting out. And I had, there was no place else to go. So I'm one of those people for whom AA was really the last house on the block, you know. And and I'd like to tell you that the journey in sobriety has been really fantastic. It has been it has been interesting. <laughs> it has been at times exhilarating, at times depressing. It has been nothing less than life itself. You know, um, nobody, when I got here, promised me anything other than the fact that I would not drink. They didn't tell me that, you know, the skies were going to open and balloons were going to fall and a parade was going to happen, although I will admit it. One year, I was the, I'm the type of drug. See, Cindy's shaking her head. She remembers. I was waiting for the parade. <laughs> I'm a year sober, break out the party. You know, I'm one of those people. But, um, you know, the thing that, that, I would hope the newcomers get that I started getting once I was sober in meetings 
was that an alcoholic has lost the ability to control their drinking. You know, we really are mentally and bodily different. And there have been times along the path I've tried to ignore that or act like it's not true. But I tell you what, recently I've become very aware that, yeah, I am mentally and bodily different from my fellows, you know. And it doesn't matter how long I've been sober. I am still mentally and bodily different from my fellows. The trick today is as long as I don't ingest alcohol, it's cool. And I'm not one of those people who believes that just reliance upon God is what keeps me sober. I won't say that, you know. Certainly find a power greater than yourself and rely upon it. However, there's a hell of a lot of action you got to get to, you know. And I watch a lot of people who get real spiritual and get drunk, you know. And it doesn't work like that. I believe today my prayer with God is, God, you do your 50%, which is my insides, and I'll do my 50%, which is my outsides, you know. So that's what I try to carry with me today. I'm certainly glad that Jimmy asked me to speak here. Um, you know, we do. We get to form bonds around here that mean a hell of a lot, and lately it's meant a lot to me to have the friends. that I'm looking around and seeing some of them. It's choking me up, but... You know, I sat there today, this morning, me and a friend of mine, and we took our law school exam this morning at McGeorge, and I sat there again, and I looked up at the medallion that said, University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law, and I thought, how the hell did an ex-drug dealer drunk get here, you know? But I was there, and I knew I had a right to be there, you know? So things do change. Please do keep coming back. Nice to see you. Mr. Mark, I'm an alcoholic. Happy birthday, everybody who's having a birthday, and um, especially the one the guy with one day, and uh, especially my best friend, Kelly. Um, put this watch down here. Oh, where did all you people come from? God, I figured out the reason why there's nobody here with over 30 years sober is because they're probably so damn old they're home in bed right now. Um, they go to new meetings if you want to see them. <laughs> um, <laughs> My first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, from what I've heard tonight from a couple of the people, was in uh, 1982. And I wasn't one of these guys that walked in and the lights went on and I said, oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, what it was was I, I went to see a friend in the treatment center and I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous through H&I. Um, I walked into this treatment center and these people had on paper robes with their asses hanging out the back and they stunk and they looked terrible. And here I was in a three-piece suit, hips looking cool. And um, they started this thing called an AA meeting, and everybody started whining about all their problems and all the terrible shit they did, kind of like what we do. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I got really angry, and I walked to the front of the room, and I said, you assholes, man. You know, if you got a problem with drinking, just don't drink. You know, I've been drinking for years, man, and none of this shit has ever happened to me, and I was drunk. <laughs> and this one old man in the back of the room stood up, and he said, yet. Yeah, and I flipped him off and left and um, <laughs> went to the bar. Um, within a year, all those things happened. You know, the, the drunk drivings and, and the insanity that it talks about in the book. You know, that was there, but it was really predominant. There's something really miraculous and spiritual that happens in your first meeting. And usually the person isn't aware of it when it's happening, and the person who's delivering the message isn't aware of it. But the seed of this program is planted inside your heart where your mind can't get a hold of it, that if you ever get that bad, you got a place to go. And I had to get that bad. Um, my last drunk, it, it, it was it was an average night. You know, I, I never sat at home and said, I'm going to drink this six-pack, and then I think I'm going to go to the Nile Station and meet somebody, and then I, I think I'll check into Santa Rita for the weekend. You know, that wasn't the way that I planned my weekends, but that was kind of the stuff that was going on. And um, my last drunk, it started on a Wednesday, and it was my parents' 25th wedding anniversary. And um, I was heavily into narcotics at that time, too, so I like to stay up for three, four, or five days at a time and pass out, eat an egg, because you got to eat, and then, you know, get it on again. And um, it was my, 20, my parents' 25th wedding anniversary, and I remember getting there, but I blacked out because I, I was a blackout drinker. Um, I came out of the blackout. I was in this bar called Fat Panties. I remember ordering a kamikaze, and I remember tilting my head, and I blacked out again. And the next time I came out of the blackout, I was completely naked in this empty apartment building with no furniture. And a dog had gone to the bathroom everywhere in there. And, you know, I mean, I came to, you know, just covered. And um, 
you know, I didn't plan that on Wednesday night, you know. <laughs> but that, you know, that's what was going on. And, you know, I came out of this blackout, and I, I weigh 148 pounds. I had colitis, which means I couldn't control when or where I was going to go to the bathroom. But I like to say there was a dog in the room, you know. And, and um, you know, I had alcoholic hepatitis, and, um, and I was just about dead, and I knew it. I had almost killed myself with alcohol and drugs. Um, I did what I'd always done my whole life. <laughs> called mom and um, <laughs> you know I didn't know where I was so I looked out and saw the street sign and she came and picked me up and took me home and bathed me and fed me and, and I slept for four or five days and I came out of it and um, and I knew that I was that bad um, I remember those people at that treatment center called Starting Point and uh, I told her I needed help my father at the time was in Oklahoma, I believe he was designing and constructing this plant for the corporation he worked for. And um, I said, Mom, I want to go to this place called Starting Point. And she said, okay, let's go. And we went down there, and it was in Hayward. And, and um, we filled out all these papers, and they said, okay, Mrs. Mello, all we need is a check for $10,000, and we'll admit your son today. And she says, I think we better call your father. And um, I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I need ten grand, <laughs> you know. And he'd heard that before, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he'd paid that before. There was people that, you know, these collection agencies that I was dealing with weren't sending you little pink notices in the mail once a week. And um, they would explain the theory of economics to my parents that it was cheaper to write them a check than it was to have my legs put back together again in Washington Hospital. <laughs> and they would write the check. Um, so he said, no. And I hadn't heard that ever. And um, I was shocked, so I caught my breath. And and I said, no, Dad, really, this is serious. And he says, no. He says, why should I invest another goddamn dime in you, man? I've sent you to psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists. You know, you've taken S. You've done all this shit, Mark. And, you know, where you soar with the eagles, I got it, you know, and, you know, I had it for about three days, and, um, <laughs> and then I lost it, and I um, still haven't found it, but I'm still seeking it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, I was devastated, man, because I, you know, I was brought up in a upper middle class family where I was a spoiled brat, and, you know, I mean, I, the word no had never been, <laughs> you know, I wasn't familiar with that. Um, so I went home, and I was devastated, and um, I got a phone call. I think it was two or three days later from a starting point facility up here in Sacramento, and it had just opened up in Orangeville, I believe. And um, they said, if you can come down today, we'll let you in for half price. And I'm a salesman, so I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I got them talked down to five grand, but they're not moving, you know. <laughs> this is it. You know, this is their bottom dollar figure. And he said, Go. All right, go. Tell your mother to write the check. And uh, he says, but if this does not work for you, Mark, you know, don't ever come back to our house again. And I knew they were serious because there was a lot of times when my dad was over the sink crying out of frustration that I had done it again. Um, I had ripped these guys off for, I think, 1700 bucks worth of dope. They came over. He wrote them a check. A week later, I did the same goddamn thing, and they came back for another check, you know, and um that's the kind of stuff I was putting my family through. But my intentions were always, I'll pay it back tomorrow. Really, I'll get my shit together and it'll all work out. You know, just you just need to do this. It'll only be a week, you know, Dad. And um, So anyway, I checked into Starting Point on December 8th, of 1983. And I walked in and, and I was when I was going to meet Kelly because we were both from Fremont. And um, I, I remember I drank in just about a quart and I didn't even have a buzz. I did not even have a buzz. I was so terrified. I didn't know what was waiting for me. But I had on the um, the angel flight pants with the elevator shoes and the silk shirt and all the gold chains and 16 pounds of hair. No one told me the 70s had ended, you know. I mean, I was kind of <laughs> into the disco shit, you know. And, um, you know, and I go strutting in there, and, you know, my first words to him were, hey, man, where are the chicks? And he just shook his head and said, come on, you know. So I went, I, I went in there, and they, you know, put on my bathrobe and detoxed for a day. And, and, and what that did was it got me ready to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I needed that. I needed to be institutionalized. I needed to be detoxed. Um, and I needed to start. Um, Anyway, my first meeting in alcohol, my second meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous, rather, was in, um, we, I got out and I went back to Fremont, and there was a little school called El Viso School, and today it's all condos. 
And I walked in, and all there was was silver-haired old people. I mean, old people, man. And everybody was knitting, including the men, you know. And here I am thinking, I I don't know, man. This just isn't for me, you know. Uh, I don't qualify. And um, so I left that meeting. I went to another meeting, and this guy started yelling at this guy who was, you know, pretty much my age. And and I left that meeting, and I walked. I got went into Fremont Fellowship, and and um, and there was a good-looking woman in AA, and I said, right on, Alcoholics Anonymous, I've arrived. You know, and was, you know, I went to like 200 meetings in my first 90 days, and I got a sponsor, and I did all the things that they told me to do when I got out of the treatment center. I don't, I don't know why I did those things. I did them. It, it, it had been the only time in my life when someone said, do this, and I did it without any thought or effort at all. I just, they told me to do it. Um, I hooked up with this guy by the name of Steve Alter. And he's probably one of the most spiritual men I've ever met in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he just happened at the time to have been married to a cousin of mine. And um, this guy was heavily involved in H&I. I mean, this guy, big time. I mean, his last drunk, he was picked up in Arizona by the FBI on 17 counts of fraud and all this other horse shit. And, and he had been where I'd been. And, um, and he knew the way I drank, and he knew my anger, and he knew me. And... Um, and we, we got into the steps, and, and the reason that I went through the steps was because I was neurotic, basically. I didn't think I was fucked up like you people. I just had a drinking problem, you know. I mean, you guys were really sick, but, you know, I just drank and used a little too much, and I got into a little bit too much trouble when I got loaded. Um, so that's all that's wrong with me. I came from a perfect family, okay. Um, see, puppies have puppies, and kittens have kittens, and ducks have ducks, you know, and... Your family is dysfunctional only because maybe you were there, <laughs> and that's what, the way it was with me. You know, I just had my own little dysfunctional family. You know, every time I walked in the room, and um, you know, but I, I couldn't endure that until I was like sober five or six or seven years. You know, there was things that happened to me that I didn't even, I had no clue. When I was seven years sober, I found out I was sexually molested. I had no idea that that happened to me and that took place in my life, and thank God I didn't. You know, and we always talk about how denial is a real negative thing, and I'm here to tell you that in some cases denial is a gift because it will buy you the time you need to acquire the tools you need in order to deal with who you are and where you came from and what took place in your life. And um, See, what I found out at that time is there's this little tiny place inside my heart where the truth lies that my mind doesn't get to get into very much, and that's where all those things that were so traumatic to me that, that took place, I stuff those in there and I forget about them. And... Um, so anyway, you know, I was really neurotic. You know, the kind of stuff that I was doing in meetings, um, you know, I was getting into fist fights in the middle of candlelight meetings, you know. I mean, that was just an average meeting for me. This, I remember that, this old guy, man, this old fart. I, I had just gotten up enough courage to really, like, participate in an AA meeting, you know, and give my big pitch. And, and this guy got called on right after I did. He volunteered, and he just invalidated everything I said, man, and, you know. So I went, it was, I was pouring coffee that night, you know, and <laughs> don't you ever, man. So, you know, from that point on, people were, please, Mark, you know, have a seat, you know. <laughs> no one ever commented for a while. Um, but the women didn't have a problem. There was a lady by the name of Judy A. and Norma, and these were, you know, elderly women. And, and I'd be chairing a meeting, and, and right in the middle of my chair, they'd say, stop lying. <laughs> you know, what do you do now? And, um... <laughs> You know, because cons, no cons, you know, and, and that's the kind of love that I got. You see, there wasn't a lot of young people in the area that I went to when I first got sober, and I was kind of like made the group mascot, and these people were going to pump this shit into me whether I wanted it or not. And um, and they, they talked to me in a different way. They didn't give a shit whether I liked them or not. They were more interested in saving my life, and, and that was different. Um, So anyway, being neurotic and being an egomaniac, I couldn't handle it when people were talking about stuff in meetings, and I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, especially stuff out of the book. So what I started doing was I started really studying the books, and I mean to the point of memorization, and big time. And um, I'd be in a meeting, and the topic might be acceptance, and I'd take a little bit of what you said and a little bit of what you said and a little bit of what you said, and I'd put it into this nice pitch, you know, and I'd get called on preferably in the last 10 minutes, and I'd deliver my sermon, you know, and I was kind of like a jukebox. If the topic was acceptance, I'd press A1 and blah, you know, and, <laughs> and forgiveness, you know, and, 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 you know, that's what I was. You know, my, my whole life was centered around 
an hour and a half in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't give a shit what was going on outside the doors of AA. The most important thing in my life was looking good for an hour and a half. That was it. I mean, I'd lay out my clothes before the meeting. You know, I, <laughs> this is a trip, man. I didn't even know this. I wore a suit. <laughs> I wore. I thought I wore suits, but I wore a suit to meetings for the first three months, you know. And then finally some guy said, you know, aren't you getting tired of wearing that suit? You know, I, it didn't even cry. It occurred to me that I only had one, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was like, got to look good in the hay, you know. And, um, you know, spend two hours getting ready before the meeting, you know. And, and you know, I didn't really even have an identity at that time, you know. There, I'd throw on a leather vest and gloves and I'd come in like Billy Badass, you know. Or some days go back into the angel flights I was reverting, <laughs> you know, and be like Disco Danny, you know. And, and you know, and then I, then I kind of was like my sponsor for a couple of years, you know. I, I started to acquire his laugh and his story, and you know, because I didn't have any, any identity of my own, you know. Um, the only thing that I knew about me was that I hated my guts. You know, and that I was the phoniest son of a bitch you'd ever want to meet. And if you all found that out, you wouldn't love me. And um, so anyway, you know, it's it's just like the book talks about, you know. I mean, I, I I relate to every, just about every sentence in the first 164 pages. You know, if I accept the chapter to the wives, you know, it's to the husbands. Um, hmm. So I started studying the steps. And... Um, and I went through the steps maybe four or five times. And in this time, this is really going to piss some people off. I um, I was heavily involved in h and I was probably sponsoring about 13 or 14 guys. I was the chairman of the fellowship. You know, I mean, you got to be something in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm going to detox centers once a week. I'm going to prisons twice a month. I'm going on all these goddamn 12-step calls that just piss me off to no end. And... um doing all this stuff for Alcoholics Anonymous, just in there, man, you know, just want to be this model member. And what I found was that I could run from responsibility in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have to deal with me because I was always busy solving everybody else's problems. You know, I wanted to be captain sponsor and the shell answer man. You know, just come to me, man. I'll tell you what goddamn page you need to read. And, you know, the guy's just going to go sneak out and get in his car and go, over to her house anyway, you know, but you got to give him direction. And um, <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, you know, what what I'm here to tell you is for me and this, you know, what I'm talking about tonight is my experience and, you know, my strength and maybe a little bit of hope that I can give someone, maybe someone new. But, you know, this, this is, it, it's not for everybody, you know, each one of you is going to have your own individual experience in recovery. But for the first four or five years of my recovery was basically about me unlearning, unlearning. I had to unlearn all the survival techniques and instincts that I had acquired in order to survive before I got here. And every bottom that I didn't hit out there, I got to hit in here in the areas of honesty, responsibility, trust. Um, and I did not go about any of it gracefully. Um, I am a person who has thoroughly gotten my rear whipped in, in sobriety. Um, and that's what I'm here to tell you is, is that, you know, they lied to me when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous. They said, keep coming back, man. It's going to get better. And I thought, yeah, when? You know, and it got worse, man. I mean, it got worse because now i got to feel this shit. You know, and I don't get to go to Nile Station and get it on and forget about all my problems. i got to feel the shame that I've been walking around with, with all my life. And, and now I've got to confront all these. Um, see, normally they have the steps back here. You know, it's going to be like my little Vanna White thing, you know. <laughs> we have an A. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, man, it was, I was just devastated, man. I had to start confronting all these fears that I'd been running from my entire life. And one of the worst things that, that had to go on was that I had to learn to be with me. And I'm still learning that. Um, and it hurt. It hurt big time. Um, you know, when things were going good in early recovery, man, I was like God's greatest cheerleader, man. You know what I mean? You mean, hey, you know, but I mean, the pain and the adversity in, in, in my recovery has been, um, a growing experience. And it's brought me closer to my God. Um, so anyway, you know, I I hit this bottom that was just absolutely devastating. I, I remember I went to this men's meeting, and I I hated men's meetings. You know, I, mean, I just hate men's meetings. Um, 
you know, in my group, there was a kind of like the head nut, you know, who kind of put together the, the meeting and, you know, it was like a mutual admiration society. And, um, and I walked into this meeting and I asked this guy to sponsor me when I had five years and he looked at me and he said, you're not ready. So I went back to my home group and told everybody about the weight problem he had. <laughs> Bastard, you better quit that fucking shit. And, um, <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to say no in AA, God damn it, man. I'm going to make you look good. And, um, <laughs> you know, I went, I went back seven years later. Uh, not seven years, two years later when I had seven years. And, um, and I walked into this meeting. I had a 38 in the trunk and a quarter VO. And I told myself that if this guy doesn't help me, this is it. Um, this guy had the ability to look into my eyes and see things that I didn't want him to see, like that I was terrified and that I was ashamed and that I was hurting and that I was still killing myself, except I was doing it now, clean and sober. And um, I didn't want to ask this guy to sponsor me because he could say no. So I kind of crawled over to him. I've always been really dramatic. <laughs> I kind of crawled in just these alligator tears, man. And I said, please help me. And he looked at me and he said, you're ready. And he says, what I want you to do, Mark, is I want, to, I want you to make a list of the ten problem areas in your life. I want you to write down the things that you think might just be causing you some pain. And at the top of the list was, well, I think I'm going to the horse track a bit much every day, but I'm still way ahead. And he said, no horse track for six months. What's next on your list? And sex was like number two. So I went to number three. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you know, he figured this shit out really quick. And, um... You know, I went off the, you know, the last nine, but, but I did go back to number two, and I got the same answer for that as I did for all the others, you know. And, and what this guy was doing, he was saying, Mark, stop hurting yourself. These are all the things you're doing that are hurting you, and you don't even know it. Just like when you were drinking and using, you thought that was the stuff that was allowing you to continue to function, and it was killing you. And if you don't stop doing these things, you're going to die a very slow death in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't agree with it, you know, but I was hurting so damn bad that I said, okay. And um, and that's when my recovery began for me. It was probably when I was sober about seven years ago. You know, I spent a long time in here being dry. You know, when we got together, and he says, you know, Mark, you've studied the books. You know, you know a lot about what to say, what not to say, and blah, 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 blah. He says, but this time we're going to go through the steps, and I might not teach you one thing you don't already know, but you're going to goddamn do stuff this time and I'd never done that man you know my thing was going through the steps and oh yeah I got it and feel great and thanks you know ain't a grand the wind stopped blowing ma and yeah let's get it on and um, I had missed something in the 12 steps I had missed it and um, it was in the 12 by 12 and it was on the first page and it was the first sentence in the first line in the first step and it says who cares to admit complete defeat it doesn't say who lost the ability to control their drinking. You know, it, it doesn't say who got their asses whipped by alcohol. It says who cares to admit complete defeat. And at seven years in this program, I was sitting in front of this man, and I knew that I was defeated. I did not know how to live because I had been doing this stuff for a long time, I thought, at that time. And I was getting worse, and I didn't want to do it anymore because it was hurting so goddamn bad. And I knew I was screwed if I drank, and I was screwed if I didn't. You know, just what it talks about in the book. And I knew that I was defeated. And, um, you know, I had accepted the fact that I was an alcoholic. I knew that. I, it was no big deal being an alcoholic anymore at that time. Um, but I was well aware of the fact that at that, that point in my life that I did not know how to live. And it was devastating because I was in my early 30s. Um, no job. Nothing. Just, just... An AA bum, as far as I was concerned. And, um, but I was looking good in the meetings, you know, but I always look good in the meeting. And, um, you know, we got to step two and, and, and I had acquired faith. That muster seed of faith that was there when I was born was found early in recovery. When I, when I had like nine months sober, um, I was in a relationship and we moved to Modesto. <clears throat> and in Modesto, I had this little, third of an acre and the weeds were about this high and I had a 1959 trailer which slept two children comfortably and the refrigerator was in a shed right next to the trailer you know and the bathroom was about a block down the dirt road 
you know, and I moved her and her kids into my villa, and she got there and looked at it and decided it wasn't for her, you know, and I'm screaming, after all I'm giving you, you know, and, you know, she's on her way back to Fremont, you know, and, you know, we had the big AA going away party, you know, and everybody's going, Jesus Christ, Charlie, man, oh my God, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, much success, you know, and I was dying, man, because in my mind, I had failed again, and I was all alone. And my pride and my ego wouldn't let me go back to my home group and tell you guys that it didn't work. And uh, I called my sponsor a couple of days later, and he said, go to a meeting. <laughs> you know, that thought never entered my mind. And I went to this meeting, and at, the time in, in, at that time in my recovery, I was still prejudiced. Today I'm prejudiced. I'm prejudiced against people that are prejudiced. But at that time, I was prejudiced. I grew up in a little town called, called Dakota which is a predominant Mexican community, and, and I'm Portuguese, so I didn't actually, you know, I wasn't full blood, and, and you know, I fought for my life every week, you know, and, and I walked into this meeting, and all there was was that race of people, you know, and I immediately copped an attitude, and um, it was birthday night that night, and I had nine months on that night, and the guy threw me my chip, it went over my head, I had to get up out of my chair, pick up my chip, and sit back down, and no one clapped, and I was pissed, you know, and then I got called on, and I think I talked for maybe 10 minutes. And the guy said, look, Mark, if you're hurting that damn bad, you know, stick around and talk to some of the guys after the meeting. It's not a speaker meeting. And I stood up, man, and told them all to get screwed, and I'm just going to report them to central office because they weren't doing it right. <laughs> your A's sucks, man, and, you know, just go on. I'm going to kick all your asses, you know, just all this stuff. And and um, and I left that meeting with geez, these gigantic alligator tears, man. I've always been a real good crier. I've never been one of these people that sits in the back of the room and, you know, I, uh, I had that gut cry, you know. <laughs> it's the greatest cry in the world, I'm telling you, man, because there's no tears involved. It's it's the release of pain, and it's part of the surrender. You know, I only get it today about, you know, maybe once a year. But back then I was having it on a weekly basis, and... Uh, I left that meeting, and I was driving down this one-lane road with orchards on both sides, and I made a decision to drink. I was going to drink. Screw this. The phenomenon of craving wasn't there. The compulsion wasn't there. Nothing. It was just a conscious decision that I'm going to drink. Screw this shit. And because they told me there was just friends I hadn't met yet, <laughs> you know, and they, they probably were, but I didn't give it a chance. And um, and I said probably one of the most sincere prayers to my God that I've ever said. I said, "All right, you son of a bitch." If you're really there, do something. And nothing happened. Nothing. I was hurting even worse. And, uh, and I, I driven by this intersection and I saw these lights. And any drunk knows, man, wherever there's lights, there's something happening. So I turned my car around and I went towards the lights. Ooh, kind of spiritual. I go towards the light. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, I came up to the stoplight and it was like red forever. I just forever, man, you know, I'm tapping my foot and I'm uh, thinking about running it. And and on the right, they had a quick stop, and I knew they had beer there. I just, you know. And on the left, all there was was this building, and on the glass was painted 12 by 12. And I kind of peered in like this, and all I saw was this huge coffee pot. And I said, okay, I'll take a chance. And I parked my car, and I walked into this building. I'd never been there in my life, and it was two minutes to eight, and they were having an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And everybody there reminded me of someone at home. And, um, you know, they they gave me a chip, and everybody clapped, you know, and then I got called on to talk for 20 minutes, you know, and no one told me to shut up. And, you know, at nine months, I don't know how the, how I caught this, but accidentally I was awake enough in this program to see that God had done for me what I could not do for myself. And I was blown away, and I had a real life, honest-to-goodness spiritual experience. It still gives me goosebumps when I talk about it today. Um, and I've had the bases covered ever since that point. So what I did was I, I went back to the campsite, so to speak, and loaded everything up and, and um, went back to Fremont to tell everybody about it. I found God. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'd acquired that faith, but there wasn't any trust yet. Um, you know, but when I was sitting in front of this man, we, we got to the third step. And he said, tell me about your God, Mark. And I, you know, I got into the cosmo shit and, you know, and he's out there and all omnipotent. You know, I knew all the right words to say, but he says, no, t tell me about your personal God. And I was raised a Catholic, you know, and I knew in AA that being a Catholic was a bad thing because I heard about all these recovering Catholics and all these smart ass comments, you know, in AA meetings and all this other stuff. And, um, 
You know, I couldn't find out where in the, in the book it said that stuff. You know, I was seeing things like, be quick to see where religious people are right, make use of what they offer. Uh, we must lose our prejudice against organized groups. Yeah, those are the things I was seeing. But when I was coming to meetings, people were talking about that stuff, and everybody else was laughing, so I knew that I couldn't be that. Even though I went to parochial school my whole life, and my grandmother was dead set that I was a Catholic. You know, I mean, when I was small, I got pictures of me in my little purple gangster suit, you know, receiving communion and stuff. And and um, but I was I was afraid to have the God that I grew up with, and it wasn't because of the fire and brimstone and all this other stuff that I've heard other people have experienced. Because I never heard anything like that. It was just because I was ashamed, and. Uh, so I got into my big Cosmo thing, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And then I got into, well, he threw himself down in the world and broke himself into millions of pieces, and everybody's got some. That's my God. And I said, what's your God? And he said, well, there's a picture of my God in the 16th chapel. And I said, you mean Jesus? And he says, yeah. And it's like, okay, that'll be my God, too. And that's my God. You know, it doesn't have to be yours. You know, you can use Alcoholics Anonymous, your sponsor, her, him, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, you know, just whatever. But... You'll, you have to establish your own relationship with your own God, and that's the thing that separates us, separates us from the dogma of the religion. Um, although, if you look up the word spirituality, what it says is a form of religious practice. Oh, you know, so, but we're not a religious program. I swear to God. Um. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, this guy gave me permission to believe in my God. And I was getting ready to do the third step for probably the thousandth and tenth time. And um, I was scared to death because there's a line in the third step that says, We thought well before taking this vital step that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly unto him. And I hadn't done that yet. And I knew that if I was going to get down on my knees with this man, that it was going to be the real deal. And I was scared shitless. And, and I did it anyway. You know, and what we did was we, we got on our knees, and he put his one arm around me, and he put one arm towards the sky, and um, we said the prayer. And I was bawling through the whole thing. It was the first time I'd ever cried through it. And um, my life hasn't been the same since. You know, we got into the fourth step, and, and I'd probably written, I don't know, maybe 16 or 17 inventories up until that point. You know, and I had I had all the dramatic stuff in the treatment center, you know, about the kid next door, you know, and just all that stuff, you know, and... Um, that was another wonderful thing that took place was that I told my secrets in there. I think I had three secrets and I spit them up, you know, and after I did, everybody else in the group did too. And some of them were even worse than the ones that I had. So I didn't feel so bad after that. But, um, you know, on this inventory was something that wasn't on any other inventory before. And what it was, was, and I didn't even think it was a big deal, but I wrote it down anyway, because it just kind of kept coming up. And it, what it was, was, well, one night I got into this fight with this guy and, I hit him a little too hard, and I hit him a little bit too many times, and I think he's dead. And I read it, you know, and it was just like a Saturday night thing to me. And uh, my sponsor said, you think you murdered somebody? I started bawling, man, because I never, you know, I always like to candy coat everything. You know, I'm, I'm not a liar, I'm just dishonest. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> you know, I didn't like looking at things in black and white. He says, you think you murdered somebody? And I, and I said, yeah. And, um. Uh, he says, I want you to go into therapy for that. And I, he says, I want you to call this therapist and make an appointment. And I called this therapist and I said, yeah, is there anything you got to call the police for? And she says, only if you've molested a child or murdered anybody. <laughs> Click. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to find an easier, softer way. <laughs> and, um, but I was hurting so bad that I called her back. You know, I see, this is my experience, okay? As soon as the pain of what I'm doing outweighs the fear of me trying it a different way, then I'll try it a different way. There's no virtue in any of the steps I've taken. There's been no virtue in me changing any parts of my character or anything. It's because what I'm doing is hurting so goddamn bad, and I've shot every angle I can think of to fix it and to where it's going to come out best for me, and it doesn't work, so I try it this way. And... Um, and I called this lady and I said, uh, yeah, I think I killed somebody. I want to make an appointment with you and, you know, come in and talk about it. I need to talk. And she says, come on down. And I went down and, and I started talking about that night. And um, she gave me all this footwork to do. You know, she wanted me to find out what this guy's name was, go back to the house where it took place, get his name, go to the DMV, you know, I mean, just do all this shit, you know. And, and I did. And um, two weeks to the day, 
that I went and saw that therapist, one of my old running partners comes strutting into Alcoholics Anonymous, a guy by the name of Marco. And Mark there that night, he was fighting this white guy, and I was fighting somebody else. And um, and I said, hey, man, do you remember that night when we were in Union City and we got into that nasty one? And, you know, I said, did that guy die? And he says, nah, man. Shit. He lives in Discovery Bay, man. He's got a wife and family, and he's doing great. Boom. Instant freedom. Instant freedom. You see, because I had done my part, I choose to believe that God decided to do his and that's the way it works for me. If I want to sit at home and sit on my ass, the, one of the lessons I learned real early in recovery was I was dying, man. I mean, I was absolutely dying. I was on the couch for four days in my underwear. I couldn't eat. You know, that fat guy who smokes a cigar on Channel 36 was preaching, you know, touch the TV, be saved. I was doing all this shit, you know. <laughs> and I prayed for four days, man, to have God remove the pain, and nothing happened until I got my ass off that couch. And unfortunately, it's been that way ever since. You know, I have got to get off the couch and do something. And um, and I'm not always thrilled about it. <clears throat> and see, what this was, and, and Kelly worked with me tremendously on this. See, Kelly's one of the only real psychologists I know. You know, there's a lot of AA psychologists that have their AA degrees, so to speak, you know, to your sober. <laughs> but he, like, went to school and all this other stuff, so he knows about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It, well, you can't apply it in your own life, but it works good on other people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I'm gonna tell the truth here. So, um, <laughs> so you know, this is what my life has been like up until this point. That any time anything starts to get good, I jump off into the ship pond on the other side. As soon as nice things start happening in my life, I start sabotaging everything. And the reason of it is, is because I don't deserve shit. That's when, that's the malady inside of me, let alone the spiritual malady. And this is something that I've been working on a long time, is that I don't deserve nothing. Because if you knew, then you'd understand. And that's been something that has been thousands of dollars worth of therapy, thousands of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, a couple hundred bucks worth of books, you know, I mean, you name it, anything to get over this thing and... um and I had a sponsor that didn't agree with that. As a matter of fact, we argued about it. And he told me that I deserved good things. I couldn't buy it. And I remember the day I was sitting at home and I thought, maybe, just maybe, I deserve good things and deserve to have a good life just because I'm God's kid. That could be the only reason why a guy like Mark Mello would deserve to, you know, have a good life. And, uh, that, as God's child, I had God's grace. And there wasn't anything that I was going to do to earn it. There wasn't anything I was going to do to take it away. That it was unconditional. And he loved me very simply because I was his. That could be the only reason why I deserved good things. And, um, and I worked on that for about a month. And then all of a sudden, my life started to change. And, and there was a lot of outside stuff that came into my life and a lot of inside stuff where I could look at myself while I was shaving and say, hey, man, you're an okay guy today. I, I kind of like you. And um, and then it went to maybe, just maybe, I can hang on to this for a little while without screwing it up. And today, I can stand in front of you and tell you that it's very simply, thank you. And... Um, so we were, you know, we got through the fourth and the fifth step and, um, you know, we got onto the sixth step and I, those are, in my opinion, two of the toughest steps to practice. Um, you know, I had learned some buzzwords in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, like pray for the willingness to be willing, you know, and you got a month before you have to get off your ass and do anything because you're trying to get willing. And, um, and I pulled that one on him and he says, uh, uh-uh. <laughs> he says, it says right here that the rest of the remaining steps call for affirmative action, not affirmative thinking. And um, he says your willingness isn't you giving God permission. Your willingness is you doing it whether you want to or not because you're going to demonstrate it. And um, and that's what he was asking me with those things like stop going to the horse track, stop going to Reno, you know, stop doing all this stuff that's hurting yourself, you know. You have to stop the action. And... Um, 
You know, I had a long list. See, I still have every single defect of character that I walked in here with. It's just today they wear different masks than they did 11 years ago or whatever it is. Um, you know, and what I realized, I, I did this inventory this way one time. I wrote, I, I took one piece of paper because I've done the 40 pager, you know, and I've done the eight pager and blah, blah, blah. I've done it the way the book says. I've done it the way Hazleton says. I, I've tried a lot of different things. If you want the promises that are in the book, you're going to have to do it the way the book tells you to do it. Um, but this one inventory that I did, I wrote down one word stuff. And on the first front of the page, it was like selfish, self-centered, dishonest, cheating, lying, you know, um, manipulative, user, uh, blah, 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 blah. And on the other side of the page, it was kind, loving, because I could think of one time when I was kind, kind, loving, considerate, you know, giving, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, and I realized that, that with God's love, I could be any kind of man I wanted to be, you know, and that, that it, it, there's no arrival point. You know, some days are going to be not as good as others, and some days are going to suck, but that I could be the kind of human being I want to be. And uh, I got onto the seventh step, and I, man, I, I never, re I had a, a wild experience with the seventh step. Um, what this guy wanted me to do is he wanted me to change some of the words in the book, in the 12, in the 12 by 12. And um, I thought, oh, great, man, here we go again. You know, we'll do it your way. And um, what he wanted me to do is he says, every time the word humility appears, Mark, I want you to replace it with the words, a desire to seek and do God's will. And I had done that. And I read it, and the step just opened up to me. You know, it just it hit me right between the eyes. You know, a sentence is like, a desire to seek and do God's will can be the healer of pain. You know, what this, what this was talking about, this attitude it was talking about, was something that my sponsor, I got to fly out to Minnesota, I think five or six years ago, and hook up with the guy that was my sponsor for the first five years, and, and he asked me, he says, Mark, what are your prayers? You know, and I rolled off three, seven, and eleven, you know, like any good neurotic would, and he said, is that it? And I said, yeah, <laughs> you know. And I said, what are your prayers, Steve? And, and he prayed for like 45 minutes. You know, I'm twitching my thumbs and stretching, my, you know, it's like, when is this guy gonna get through, you know? And um, he says, Mark, I've disciplined my life, and I've got the structure of my life. This is the amount of time I want to give to my higher power in the morning. I pray to him throughout the whole day. It's not the quantity. It's not the, qu it's not the quantity. It's the quality, blah, 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 blah. But he says, if you want to become an old-timer in this program, you must enlarge your spiritual life. And now it's time for you to start enlarging your spiritual life. And I said, okay. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to come up with a prayer that's going to be your gift to your God. And when you say it, you're going to be able to feel it and experience it. And I said, okay. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to read the St. Francis of Assisi prayer 50 times in the 11th step. And I want you, maybe you can pick up a, a prayer out of that. And I said, okay. And I, and I flew back to California and um, he called me about a week later and he says, how many times have you read, and, read it? And I said, I, I haven't accidentally told the truth nine times man <laughs> and he says mark i'm dead serious about this you've got to do this it is time you've got to do this so i hung up with him on the phone and um i read the prayer a couple times and and this is the prayer that i came up with okay if it help if it can help you great if not fine but and it's very simply this father help me to acquire and maintain an attitude of what i can give to my fellow man and add to life rather than what i could suck out of it thine will be done that's my prayer. I don't do it every day. I wish I could tell you I did, but I don't. Um, but you see, when I say that prayer and I try to acquire that attitude that I'm talking about, the attitude of giving, I have some wonderful days, man. Because the only time I'm screwed up is when I'm afraid I'm going to lose something or I'm afraid I'm not going to get something that I want or I'm afraid this is the big one that someone's going to take away something I got. You know, that... That's the only time I'm really messed up, you know, unless some little new turds float into the surface about something that happened 35 years ago, you know. But, <laughs> you know, that that's basically it throughout my day. And, um, you know, but when I can get that attitude going and all of a sudden I become not so important and I'm not worried so much about me, then I have some really wonderful days. Um, you know, steps eight and nine kind of went together for me and, you know, I, I've got more wreckage in my recovery than I do in my past. I do. I'm not the guy who came in here and got good, okay? 
I, I think I came in here and got real sick, you know. That's been my experience. Um, and today I still can't tell you that I'm in here and I got good. I think what's happened for me is that I just got a little bit healthier. Um, you know, I still have amends to make. But for me, the amends, this is this is a big one. My parents got divorced after 30 years of marriage, and um, I got to make amends to my dad. What I got to do was he was devastated, gone, tweaked, worse than any AA member I've ever seen in my life, over the edge, wanted to kill himself. Um, and I got to move in and feed him and take care of him and love him and listen to him and hold him, and that's my amends. And it's not something that's completed. I don't have one amend that I've ever made that has been completed yet. What I do is on my eighth step, I take a pen and I make an X through it where I can still see it, but I know that I've already done my part. And my job is to continue to do my part. And every one of them has to do with whatever it was that I did, not doing it again. Um, my mother laid this real heavy one on me that I haven't been pulled, I haven't been able to pull off. If you want to make amends to me, Mark, just be happy. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so you come in with tears. Oh, oh yeah, wonderful. Yeah, work better, feel better, having a better time. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, the test step, um, I really don't have time to go through all 12 of these, but the test step, this, this is something that I did. Okay, and I, I strongly suggest anybody wants to, because if you're going to do it the way the book tells you to do it, this is the way it says to do it. You pick up a pen, and you write your tenth step out. And one of the things that happened for me was that I slowly got to get introduced to me as a result of writing, because when I write, a lot of times I accidentally put down the truth before I have a chance to think about it, you know? And what I started doing was I just started writing down whatever it was that I did, and... um and when you look at it in that perspective and take responsibility for that, I mean, it's real easy to, to see the difference between right and wrong. And um, so write out your test up. It's a pain in the ass, especially on Christmas. You know, I mean, who wants to write on Christmas, you know? But the discipline, and you know, and it's not so much that your sponsor is going to see you doing it, and it's not so much that your God is going to see you doing it, and it's not so much that your, all your friends in AA are going to see you doing it. What it is is that you're going to see you doing it. You're going to see you trying in your own recovery. And that's going to give you a little bit of self-worth, maybe. Um, see, all my life, I thought there was, this is what I hoped for, you know, there'd be this tr tragedy in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd come to the rescue, you know, and just, like, save 90 people. You know, and then all of a sudden, I'd feel good about myself. I had no idea that it had to do with paying my bills on time, not lying, not hurting people, not using... I had no idea that it had to do with all that kind of stuff, being true to myself and not betraying myself. You know, I, I was waiting for this fantastic event to take place so I would have an abundance of self-worth, and it never happened. Um, you want to know the greatest thing? I'll tell you the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. There was a guy who was a paraplegic that was walking across the street. I was putting in a security system. I was sitting on the porch having a cigarette, and this guy was walking across the street, and he was bent, and um, both of his shoes were untied, and I went over, and I got on my knees, and I tied his shoes, and it was probably one of the most ugliest, beautiful smiles I've ever seen in my life, and, and I started bawling after I did it, you know, and uh, there was no thank yous or words exchanged, but the feeling in my heart is still there today, and that's the best thing I've ever done. You know, the list of the shittiest stuff I have ever done I would have had to have started this meeting and you wouldn't have had your birthday night. Um, but anyway, the 11th step is, is this is, this is a, a great step. When it's time for you to make, meet your God, your sponsor can say, go this way. Your pastor can say, go this way. But I'm here to tell you, you got to go this way. Okay? I didn't find my God in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. That wasn't my experience might be for you. Um, where I found my God was in my living room on the floor wanting out of my skin and I had the big book, the 12 by 12 Father Jake that I got from one of my best friends, Charlie, that tells the truth about us. Um, the Bible, the 24 hour a day, just all this stuff, man. And I'm reading and I'm seeking and, and I accidentally went like this and I went, <sighs> And that's when it started. 
Because see, I get so busy talking and asking that I forget to listen sometimes. So my my God for a long time has been like Santa Claus. Gimme, 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 gimme. Here's a list of the AA shit I need today. I need acceptance and faith and trust and blah 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 blah. You know, and all this stuff. And never once did I have I ever prayed and said, Thank you for everything I have, thank you for everything I don't have, and what can I do for you today? And I love you. I've never done that at that time. I still ask for that stuff. I ask for the ability to demonstrate it. And I don't always. Let me tell you, I'll stand up here today and tell you that I, I still get afraid every day. I still feel like a phony on certain days. I still feel inadequate. Um, I still hurt. I still get obsessive, jealous, angry, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I still am very much a human being. I still blow it. I, you know, I, it's, best to keep my mouth shut and I just can't control my lips and you know they just go off and you know and <clears throat> but I've also experienced things like this lady talked about you know the peace and the tranquility of this program you know and the feeling of oneness with myself the feeling of oneness with my creator and the feeling of oneness with you you know and that's the real reason that we're here it really is it talks about it in the back of the 12 by 12 it's for guys like me to, to put down the booze, put down the symptoms, and get down to the problem. This is my own opinion, okay? I think that alcoholics love ten times greater than any other creature on this planet. And we don't know how to sh express it. And if you don't let the love out and you keep it inside, it begins to hurt. And it gets to hurt to a point where we have to turn to things like alcohol and all this other stuff, man, in order to anesthetize the pain. But we come in here and we start learning how to love again. And we start learning how to express it. And, and it's, it's absolutely one of the greatest rushes in the world. Um, and what it says in the back of the 12 by 12 is the real reason we're here is for us to learn how to get right with ourselves, get right with our fellow man, get right with our God and learn how to love. So if there's anything that I could wish any of you, and especially the newcomers, is that maybe someday and you learn how to love. You know, because along with learning how to love, it's something that's real difficult too, and it's learning how to be loved. And the people are going to do it to the point of pissing you off. But it's going to be there. And um, where I found that love was in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've tried church. I've been to churches before, but it's always a goddamn speaker meeting, and I never get called on. You know, I've even, I've sat in the front pew, hey, pastor, hey, man, let me, let me talk about this here, you know, and, you know, just come up here and get your bread and shut up, you know. <laughs> so anyway, you know, like I said, um, God bless you, and for the new people, I hope you're, I hope you're hurting like a son of a bitch, you know. I hope you don't feel too good too quick, and, um, and just keep coming back. Um, there's going to be adversity. There's going to be pain. There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to confront. But the good news is, is there's going to be freedom. Freedom. And I've been scared to death of freedom for a long time. Because if I ever experienced freedom, then I, there was going to be a degree of responsibility that had to go along with that that I was afraid of. But it is one of the most wonderful things in the world. So God bless you and thanks for listening to me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.